Hey y'all, good to see you again here on Grassroots Garden. I'm Ryan and in today's video we're going to go plant some Japanese maples in my yard. I am a Japanese maple addict and I've got probably, well, definitely over a hundred different cultivars that I've collected over the years and today we're going to plant some of those in the yard, go ahead and uh, get them from Grassroots Nursery uh, where I've got them growing. They're just kind of in the way. I've got way too many and need to get them in the ground. We're at late fall right now, so it's the perfect time to still be planting. So we're gonna plant a couple that I brought home yesterday, and then we're also gonna go grab a few more here in just a little bit. But first, I thought I'd uh, walk you guys around my personal greenhouse here at home. I uh, just got done feeding these guys right here. We've got Kona and Millie, and the McCall's behind me. They're eating their breakfast. So anyway, I thought we'd just kick around here uh, in the greenhouse, show you guys what I've got going on, and um, you know, the problem with being a plant addict is I've just got way too many plants. Um, there is such a thing because a lot of these guys don't get taken care of like they need to uh, just because I run out of time. Now we've got greenhouses at grassroots. I've got uh, greenhouses here at home. It's just a lot. But anyway, I'll take you guys around and show you what we got going on here. Morning, you guys. How's your breakfast? Kona is a uh, Catalina McCall just like Larry. And then Millie is a Millie Gold. So she's a cross between a blue and gold and a military macaw. Was breakfast good? Yeah? All right, we'll go back to eating. So I built this greenhouse. I uh, did a video on this one too, a few years back. It's probably about three years old now. And I have just got stuff everywhere. Do have quite a few variegated monsteras in here that are stock plants that we take cuttings from and uh, and propagate from. We've got a nice Florida green, Florida beauty uh, on the wall there. Orchids just about everywhere. That's what this original, the original intent for this greenhouse was just to be an orchid house. And I've got a bunch of Cattleyas. We've got a lot of uh, Vandas, which are in bloom right now. We'll get over and take a closer look. That one up in the, hanging from the ceiling there is real pretty. Got a lot of Oncidiums. They're really healthy. They like it in this greenhouse. The light and the humidity must be just perfect. But some, like I say, I just don't have the time to really get out here and tend them like I should. And this is a real cool one. Um, I forget the name, Grammatophyllum. I think it's what this one is. Kind of a cool hybrid. Really unusual colors on that one. And I put this tree uh, in the middle to kind of help support the greenhouse. And then I've just strapped orchids to it. And then I also have this really nice elbow that I kind of tucked up in a cavity, planted inside the tree and let it just kind of grow and attach itself to the tree and live his life in here. But look at this vanda here, y'all. Isn't that pretty? That is wide open. Got a bunch of blooms on the other side as well. It's time for the vandas to bloom right now, obviously. Here's a cool yellow one. Let me see if I can lift you up and see that one. That's got huge flowers on it. And vandas are true epiphytes, meaning they don't need dirt. So their roots they literally just hang and absorb everything they need uh, from the air. Really cool plant. A lot of other stuff that needs some attention on the shelves over here. I do have a Cattleya that has bloomed down here. It's kind of going past its prime a little bit. Oh, do y'all like this one? Check this little guy out. So this is an octopus orchid. See how he's... Uh, some of the petals look like tentacles. That's a pretty cool one. I think that one's actually indigenous to down around Panama, Central America. Another Vanda, purple one. Blooming right there. And a good many more Monsteras and some Philodendrons. I uh, got this huge Monstera right here that uh, has actually attached itself to the pallet wood. People ask me what they will attach to, literally anything. They'll attach themselves to the metal uh, exterior of this 
Uh, this is actually my house on the other side of this wall. But they'll attach themselves to literally anything, whatever they can grab a hold to. So I just took these pallets in an attempt to try to recycle and just stack them on the wall. And it's worked out real good. It gives you kind of little shelves and nooks and crannies to shove plants. Uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Some more. Oh, this one's cool. I didn't even know this one had uh, had opened up. And this one's actually fragrant. This is a type of Oncidium. I think it's called Twinkle. I may be wrong there, but definitely an Oncidium. But fragrant, sweet smelling little flowers there. Cool little miniature. Miniature orchid. Got this giant air plant. This thing's probably... I don't know, three feet long. It just keeps going and going. So what I want to do, I'm going to put this in the house along with this stag, um, staghorn fern. Got a little bit of scale. That's scale right there. We need to spray some neem oil. Just crutch it. But anyway, I want to take this staghorn fern and this air plant, mount them to this uh, wooden kind of frame thing that's filled with sphagnum and hang it in the house. But again, time uh, just hadn't allowed itself for me to do that little project. This is a cool uh, caladium right there. I think the name of that one is Broken Heart. It's not a Proven Winners. Kind of tricked you guys there. It's just got it in that pot, so you can't get it from Proven Winners. Somebody gave me that one a long time ago. A ton of red on it. And we just got some live uh, Spanish moss hanging throughout the greenhouse. And I just kind of rip off of it and move it around this greenhouse does great for these orchids it looks like the roof is dirty and that's because it is <laughs> it's like uh stuff kind of falls on top of the roof because it doesn't have a huge slope to it and then bacteria and junk grows on the top of the roof but it works great for in here because all of these are understory or under canopy type plants and they really like the that deep shade so got this uh I forget what this guy is Somebody, maybe y'all leave it in the comments below. Gigantium, I think, maybe. Got another big Monstera there. And then I put these shelves up. Got my little potting area, little potting desk. Put these shelves up and just got all kind of random plants up there. I don't even know what I have anymore. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a sickness, y'all. Before we head out to plant the Jack Maples, I want to walk you guys out into the aviary. I've got the birds inside right now just because it's been getting cold and they can stay nice and warm in the greenhouse but this is the aviary so you walk right out of the greenhouse out into this aviary that my buddy Aaron and a couple of the boys helped us throw together so just a metal structure with inch and, uh, one half inch by three inch uh, galvanized wire and I did some plantings in the actual floor out here oh this by the way we lay this down because it's easier to clean up because the birds crap everywhere and make a huge mess. So we just found this stuff in the landfill. It comes in a big roll. So that's why that's down there. But I planted some hardy citrus. And I forget what variety this is. Some type of orange. But it can, it can actually live in our winters. Probably get down to 10 degrees. I uh, wish I remember the cultivar name of it. But anyhow, I do remember the name of this one over here. And hopefully before too long, I'll have some of these for sale uh, at our nursery. This is a Pro Simquat. It's some crazy hybrid between a couple of different citrus trees. But it is definitely hardy. Uh, this one's been in the ground two years now. And uh, I've had them in pots outside for the past five. And they've made it through all winters. Crazy thorns on the thing but this little fruit right here you can actually eat uh the, you eat the shell the shell you eat the rind everything you just pop the whole thing in your mouth but they're real sour but i kind of like them but, uh, these will get big hopefully here in the aviary and so each of the four holes actually five holes because i planted this dwarf ginkgo and this is just weeds actually bird seed uh this dwarf ginkgo I planted the ginkgo and citrus because that is uh, non-toxic to the birds. So hopefully these will get just massive out here and then the birds will have a more jungle-like, um, you know, little habitat. 
for them, make it as natural, and they can fly around in here. This is where Larry grew up, and I may bring him back this summer just so he can kind of fly around. But anyway, there's the aviary, guys, and now let's go plant some jap maples. All right, y'all, so we are out here in my front yard now. Obviously, that's the pond back there. And then right there is where we did a bunch of those um, bog plantings a while back. We got the plant mobile loaded down, got our Japanese maples in the back. That sun is really bright. But there's the house, the porch up yonder, and then that white structure in the background. That's the greenhouse we just left out of. So just to kind of give you your bearings i told you guys we're going to try to work on these beds down here we've got three pretty large beds that are just planted mainly azaleas tea olives camellias spirea stuff like that so since i have all these japanese maples and i need to make room down at grassroots we're going to stick them in these beds because they're on irrigation and also the deer don't come down this close to the house usually and they've been giving me a hard time on all of my plants even Japanese maples, they like the little new growth coming out and they've been giving me a, a hard time. But anyway, behind me here, let me show you guys this. We've got this little Japanese maple here that didn't make it. I think this was, this was a waterfall Japanese maple. Don't really know what happened to him. He was a pretty young, small tree. And the problem with small, uh, planting small shrubs, you know, you can save money in planting them because you, you pay less for a little tree but the root system isn't as developed and that's probably what happened here he was just in a one gallon pot just didn't have a substantial enough root system to really uh, anchor himself in and survive so we're going to snatch him up and plant a larger tree i've got a bald smith japanese maple that i think will go great right here so that's what we're about to throw in the ground and we're just going to take him and rip him up see that little root system it just wasn't substantial enough to uh for him to survive evidently so we're going to chunk him leave these sticks and stuff out of the way dig us a bigger hole we're going to add compost and of course our biotone and then cross our fingers that the ball smith makes it here because it's kind of an expensive tree we've got kind of a sand clay type native soil right here so drainage is going to be an issue and that's where the compost will come in when we add it into the mix and we take our native soil and blend it 50-50 with our compost blend. Today I'm using what we call the good stuff. That's our trademarked blend of compost that we make um, at our landfill property where we do all of our mulching, grinding, and composting. And so it's a mixture of manures, also... Uh, we take waste from a local chicken hatchery. So all of the eggs that don't hatch. And then unfortunately, you know, all the baby chicks don't live. So we take those as well. And we mix that in with our compost. Along with our beneficial microbes that we buy in. And that stuff breaks down into a beautiful... Uh, compost soil amendment and so that's what we'll be blending in here today along with our native soil got some roots down here from that old oak tree making digging a little difficult but we'll chop through those and then we'll go ahead and add a little layer of our compost in the bottom and I'll grab a handful of our biotone and we'll sprinkle our biotone on the bottom of the hole. And then I'm gonna set the rest of my handful right here. And that we're gonna use to rub on the roots, make that root contact and um, you know make sure it comes in contact with them. That way they can grab hold, go out and find nutrients and bring it back to the tree. All right, here is our bald smith. We're just going to turn him on his side, hit that pot a few times, and he'll slide right out. We're going to keep this pot. This is a nice one. It has the handles on it. These are expensive nursery pots. We're definitely going to hang on to that. Then we're just going to kind of look at the structure of the tree and see how we want to position it. It's got like a bunch 
of limbs coming off that side. So I think I'm actually going to take and turn that towards the pond just like so. And there's really no rhyme or reason. Uh, the tree's gonna fill in all the way around. So when you're planting the tree, it's your tree. You position it however you want. I just wanna give the most, uh, I wanna be able to see the leaves from the pond side. And we got some weeds coming out of the pot here. So we'll go ahead and rip those out and I'll just throw them down in the hole. We'll loosen up the roots a little bit, get them somewhat straight, pointing the way I want. And then I'm gonna take the biotone. We're just gonna rub it all around the plant. And so you can see what we've done there by taking this biotone and rubbing it on the roots, it, go, it goes ahead and puts it in contact with the roots. Because what's gonna happen is those microbes, that beneficial bacteria and fungi will attach to the roots, then they'll go out and they'll find the nutrients and water, whatever the plant might be needing, they bring it back. And the plant in return for it doing that favor will give it sugar. Pretty neat relationship, a uh, real symbiotic relationship between the biotone um, bacteria and fungi in relationship with the plant, but it helps out the plant tremendously, as well as there's organic fertilizer in there too, just to help feed everybody. That's why I use it on every single planting. And also you'll see how I left the crown of the root ball well above the soil line, because we do have that clay. I don't want water puddling in this hole and drowning our plant. So if we elevate it and then we just bring the soil slightly sloped up towards it, that'll get it up out of the danger zone and allow these roots up here for sure to breathe and we don't have to worry about getting root rot and drowning our tree. Now I've already got a bucket full of the good stuff compost. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take our native soil and our compost and just kind of blend the two together and flip them right back in the hole. And you know, I always pile my dirt up when I'm digging my hole all the way around the plant. So that makes it easier just to kind of rake and from 360 degrees, rake right back to the root ball. And I'm just gonna break up this clay and we're just gonna do that gentle slope like we just talked about. So that those roots stay well out of this old clay soil and we don't have to worry about drowning our tree. And that way when the irrigation comes on or the rain, it just comes down in here, gives the right amount of water, and then it can flow on out and get away from those roots. And dump that out like so. And then we'll just continue to make that nice slope Add back some of our native soil. See how clay that is? That'll definitely hold uh, too much moisture were we to use just 100% of that. Scoot around here. Bring this soil back in. We're gonna tamp it. We're not gonna, we don't want it hard as concrete, but we're just gonna kinda lightly pack around our tree and then later on we're not going to do it today but we'll bring in our mulch and that will keep the weeds down and keep it nice and moist around our root ball not wet but moist and so there you have it folks that is how you plant a japanese maple in clay soils so let me see how far I can get down here. And y'all can see how I've planted it kind of on top of the ground. And that, again, is just to ensure it stay out of that wet zone. But that's how you do it right there. And then we'll bring the mulch in and mulcher. It'll make that slope a lot less dramatic. And you really won't even be able to tell that that hill is there. We'll just mulch it nice and thick. Bring our mulch line out kind of like a nice little curve make it look like a natural bed and uh, she should do just fine and we'll get those beautiful fall colors from the uh, um, from the leaves of this bald, bald smith japanese maple
Now, let's go see what other varieties we got. We'll throw them in the ground too. All right, guys, we're down here at Grassroots Nursery. Uh, this behind me is a little grow area where I've got all of my Japanese maples, or most of them, just kind of growing here. Um, a lot of these were going to be available down in the Japanese garden area, which I got a cool video coming up really soon on a creek we're putting in and building this awesome Japanese garden area. It's just going to be it's going to be outstanding. So make sure you follow along so you catch that video too. But anyhow, we're here Sunday. The store behind me is closed and we've got our truck backed up right there. So let's walk through here and pick us out a couple more cultivars, kind of get this area cleaned out a little bit and uh, add a bunch more Japanese maples to our yard. So our next plant is a uh, Jaime Shoujo. This is a dwarf red leaf Japanese maple about five feet high probably six seven something wide and i think this will be a good spot right here so we're in this big long bed there way down there that's the one we just planted the ball smith down on that corner and my beds are so full i'm running out of room to plant these and i still got a bunch more so we're just going to have to kind of crowd them well, i think that'll be a nice spot right there to plant this uh jaime shoujo japanese maple also i was going to tell you guys a lot of these I got from Mr. Maple. So you can go to mrmaple.com. There's um, some brothers up in Asheville, North Carolina, that are way worse addicts than me when it comes to Jap maples. I actually went up there and met, um, let's see, Tim and Matt. Uh, they're really nice guys, really know their stuff, and have a, a cool mail order uh, website so you can get any of these maples on there if they have them in stock. That's where I got this one from in particular. Just been growing it in this pot for a little while. So let me go grab my shovel out of the plant mobile there and we'll get this puppy in the ground. All right, we're not gonna to move too far for the next planting. Uh, there's our Jaime Shoujo. I'm gonna move just right over here and we're gonna plant this green strap. This is a really cool, kind of a finer leaf Japanese maple. Really nice color, as you can kind of see there, it's getting towards the end of the season, but uh, beautiful oranges and yellows. That's another one I got from from Mr. Maple. So this is Acer Palmatum green strap and I'm going to put it right here. Uh, it's kind of close to this red bud which this is a cool cool red bud right here. It's a it's not uh, labeled as a weeper as you can tell by the habit. It's heavily heavily weeping. This is flamethrower so it's a red bud and uh, one of the coolest red buds I've ever seen. Pretty um, new introduction here just a few years back we got a couple of those for sale at uh, at the nursery but I think if we come six or so feet that's probably a little bit further that's probably seven seven feet away should be fine most of these Japanese maples that I have are pretty um, pretty small growers and then in the background right there that is a Carolina uh, sapphire cypress love the color of that dude really really pretty so let's see uh, if we can't get this one planted. And then I think it almost be time to head to the nursery. I'll let you guys come with me and we'll go pick out a couple more. Okay, so we'll add our biotone to the bottom. I'll leave me a little pile right there. I'll take and give her a couple good wax. And usually they slide right out when you do that. And we'll take a look at her. It's got kind of a fan shape a little bit. 
So this one really doesn't matter tremendously. How we place it, it's just gonna, it's pretty full. So this one really could go in any kind of way we see fit. We got our biotone down the bottom of the hole as well as our compost. Straighten her up a little bit and I went ahead and sprinkled the compost around with our native soil. So as I push it in the hole, and I forgot to put my other biotone, so I'll do that right now. Rub it all around the root ball and just push it in the hole. But by putting it in a 360 degree, or putting your soil and your compost all the way around the tree, you can just rake it. And it makes for faster, easier planting. And we're just going to tamp it again, not pack it. And a lot of times what I do... The slope's coming down down towards the camera right now, down towards y'all. I'm going to try and build up this side just a little bit so that when it does rain, all that surface water just doesn't go right over our tree and down to the pond. So by building this side up a little bit, we can kind of help slow that water down and give it time to, uh, to go down to the roots of our tree and it's nothing dramatic it's not a huge shelf or anything we just want to want to bring that elevation up just a little bit just to slow that sheet flow down that's where the mulch comes in handy as well if you mulch real heavily when that when it does rain the water is not just going to run right across the top of the ground it's going to give it time to uh, to percolate and to get into the soil so mulch just adds you know so many benefits weed suppression keeping the soil moist and helping with erosion and uh, holding that water when it does come holding it in the bed so multiple benefits from mulch for sure all right y'all let's head down to the nursery and get us some more japanese maples so we've got well over a hundred different varieties or cultivars there's over three thousand cultivars of Japanese maples and I'm pretty sure I need one of each one of them but we're just going to go through here select a couple um, probably some smaller ones majority of them and then we'll pick us out a couple big ones to go around the yard too if we can find an area where the that can take one of the large ones so I'm going to go through here pick out a couple and we will uh, head back to the house and get to planting all right, y'all, we're back from the nursery now, and the next one that we're going to plant, we're going to plant up here on the corner of the aviary, and this one is a fire glow maple, so I'll walk away a little bit so y'all can see. We've got plenty of room behind me, because this one's going to get pretty big, 15 to 20 feet tall, probably 15, 15-ish wide in 10 years or so. It'll take a little while to get there, but it does get a little bit larger, and I brought over some of our Espoma land and sea compost because I know this is heavy clay up here because I put it there. Um, we had to bring in clay to compact for the aviary construction. And so this is just going to be straight red clay. So we're going to need to do similar to what we did in the front yard, kind of planting on top of the ground. So we've got that compost in addition to the good stuff that we make just to make sure we have that drainage because if not, it'll, it'll for sure die. So let's get this one in the ground. Okay, let's see what we're dealing with here. We want to stay off this corner, off this building a couple of feet oh yeah that's that's some good old clay soil right there it is really hard to get that shovel in there even though it looks like topsoil that is some heavy clay material and probably some good old georgia red clay up underneath it because that's what we brought down to build the pad but to take this and kind of as always, sack 360 degrees around our hole. But it, it's tough digging, y'all. I'll take this and I just always kind of flop it over like that to break it up. Make it easier for me to put back in the hole. Okay, so there. Uh, sorry, I'm breathing heavy. <laughs> That's my hard digging. There's our old Georgia clay right there and some rock down there as well. That's some hard, hard digging. 
right there. So what I'm gonna do is come in and put a few inches of compost right now of the land and sea. And my camera's doing whatever it wants to do. So we're gonna put the land and sea in there, add our bio biotone, and then plant our tree. And then I'm gonna add a majority of compost back into this hole. We will take some of this native topsoil and mix it in uh, with the compost as well. This is heavy moisture holding clay slash topsoil. So we don't want a whole lot of, in, of that in there again, just to keep the root environment as dry or as well drained as possible. So here is our land and sea compost. Really like this stuff. Had great results with it. Been using it for a little while now. You just shake about a quarter bag down in the hole and come in and we'll just kind of feather it out. That'll allow for great drainage for the roots of this uh, fire glow Japanese maple. And we'll take, sprinkle our biotone all around. Save us a little bit to put on the actual root ball. Let's grab our tree. Throw him right here. Give him a little help coming out of the pot. And I'm going to get rid of these weeds because we don't want them getting in our yard. We'll loosen up the root ball a little bit. And we're going to take and set him, make sure the depth is right. And that looks about, about good right there. So then I'll go ahead and take the little bit of biotone that I saved. And we're just going to rub it right around and sprinkle it around those roots. And then I brought some of our good stuff compost. I'll go ahead and sprinkle a little bit of it. Kind of go ahead, continue filling our hole up with that. Now let's go with a little bit of native topsoil. Kind of crunch it up with our hands, break up those clay balls. Go ahead and make sure he's like we we want him as far as straight up and down. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good right there. This is a large red leaf jap maple. So it'll have red leaves all summer long, all growing season long. And then in the fall, those will turn ember and just give a, well, as the name implies, look like it's glowing. Beautiful tree. It's quite large too. So it should really make a statement in the corner of this, this aviary. Bring in a little bit more of our land and sea compost. And then we'll come back with some more, bust this up off our grass of the native soil, like so. And we can even plant the grass back if we want. I'm gonna eventually gonna mulch this guy but if you wanted the grass back up around him, just as long as you don't get up too close to the trunk so that a weed eater, a lawnmower, or whatever, we want to make sure we protect that trunk. Give him a couple little good tamps. Just like so. Bring some more native soil back. Got kind of a hole up here. So we'll throw some dirt in there, level that spot up. And then these big chunks of grass that I uh, don't have a use for anymore, we're simply gonna take them and throw them in our compost pile. And there we go, y'all. That's our fire glow maple. And he should get really, really nice and big right here on the corner of the greenhouse. And we've got a couple other few little things I've planted. So this is a weeping yopon holly. Nice red berries, which I'm surprised the birds haven't gotten to yet, but it was loaded down. But they love those things. We got our beehives over here. Nice brown turkey fig planted in between them. Uh, Vitex, which I did a video on a good while back. And then this one I've never showed you guys. This is a golden rain tree. Let me try to get y'all out of the sun. Really pretty small tree. Doesn't like much now because it's gone dormant. Those are all the bracts that contain the seeds in it right now. 
But in the late fall, those things are golden and they hang down, hence the name uh, golden rain tree. But a beautiful little tree. And I'm gonna show you guys the other maples that I'm gonna go find spots for. And unfortunately, y'all aren't gonna be able to come with me because my camera just gave me the low battery signal. So at least I'll just show you guys what we're gonna plant and then y'all can watch them grow with me. Uh, this was Azuma Murasaki. This is a, another little dwarf, really nice Jap maple. And then I think this one's, uh, yeah, Arakawa. Really nice fall foliage tree, pretty green bark. And then this one here is winter red. And just look at this bark. Isn't that pretty? So when it's cleaned up, like when you shine it up a little bit, really has a nice orange red color to it. Same the same family as the uh, coral bark maples. In fact, it is a coral bark maple. Uh, the most famous one is probably Sango Kaku. It's what a lot of the nurseries have. And this one I got from uh, Mr. Maple, Mr. T. I don't know much about it. Uh, I'll have to, we'll just have to watch that one grow because I really don't know what, uh, what all it's gonna do. Then let's see, we've got, oh, peaches and cream. This is a nice variegated uh, Japanese maple. So that one will be fun to watch grow. And then I've got, this is a no name, so we're gonna have to find out what he is. And I got another Arakawa right here. So gotta go find a spot to put those guys in real quick while I'm filming and since they're right in front of the plant mobile. I, for some reason, was in a really good mood about two years ago and a buddy of mine said, hey, you." You want some Firefall Japanese maples? And I was like, sure. So he was ordering a lot of them. Evidently, I ordered 250. So I've got a lot of planting to do. These will all go in one gallons, and um, then they'll go up to threes, and then they'll be for sale at the nursery. But uh, just one more thing to do that uh, I really don't need to do, but I forgot I even ordered them. But while we're right here, you see two groupings of them. These are high graft. So you can see how the graft is way up high. Come on, camera. Way up high on the stem. And that's usually more desirable because uh, these are weepers. So the higher up you have your rootstock, then the more mature the tree looks at an earlier age. And you don't have to train it up as high before you let it go and allow it to weep. Whereas these over here are low grafts. Now these are fantastic for bonsai. And you can train them up, but you can see they're a good six, ten inches shorter than the high grafts. So these will be available for sale in probably two to three years. I'll have them down at the nursery. These are a nice uh, red lace leaf. There's still a leaf hanging on right there. Let's see if I can zoom in and show you. Yep. So that's what they do right there. Just a nice cut leaf Japanese maple. Great for small space and small gardens. So before the camera dies, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you guys bye. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I gotta go get busy planting the rest of these and y'all uh, now be a good time. If you found any useful content here, hit that like and subscribe down there as well as the little bell. Notify you when more videos come out and you guys get to watch with me. This landscape continue to evolve. Watch these trees grow, see what they do. And uh, we'll learn together because the more you know, the more you grow. See you guys next time. Thanks, y'all.